Uh, what I wanted to do, uh, and some of you who are around New Way in the summer, you'll have heard me do what I'm about to do in, in the time we have remaining in this session, is I, I want to talk about uh, becoming outward focused in a way that I think really matters, in a place that I think really matters to God. I want to talk about um, learning to move with God just in your everyday rhythms, in your everyday ordinary life and recognizing his power there. We've talked about becoming outward focused, even in spite of our weakness and loneliness and brokenness. We've talked about being moved, being moved by compassion, being moved with authority, being moved in power. Um, and in this session, I, I want to look at uh, just what God's mercy allows us to do when we get hold of it. So apologies if you've heard me speak in this before. It's just... Um, how many of you were at New Wine in the summer and you heard me talk on Romans 12? Oh, then I'm making needless apologies. Brilliant, brilliant. It's, it's only like 12 weeks ago, uh, so you'll be, it'll be unsurprising to you that it's burning in me still, right? It's only 12 weeks ago. So Romans 12, if you have a Bible, that's where we're going to go. Um, that's where we're going to look at. Let me just give you a little bit of context in this. This letter is written by a man who's utterly captivated by Jesus. His life has been radically transformed. He's gone from being someone on the verge of committing an act of terror to being someone who is absolutely radically altered forever. And it all happened through an encounter that he had with Jesus. And he's kind of writing to people and he's explaining to them what the story of God looks like and how they can begin to engage with that. And uh, he gets to chapter 11. Sorry, I'm just making sure I get the right thing here. He gets to chapter 11 on this, and it all gets just a little bit too much for him. And he, he's just explaining how God in Christ is bringing all things everywhere together. And he gets the chapter living and he says, Oh, the depths, verse 33, of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him for from him and through him and for him are all things to him be the glory forever and ever. And he, he just, like all good theology, he comes to this moment where he it just begins to exclaim in doxology his worship to God for his wisdom in bringing all things under Christ. And so he comes out of that and he says this in chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy... That's what we've spent a little bit of time talking about this morning. God's mercy he says, when you've got a view of that and when that's got a hold of you, it begins to work in you. You begin to realize that God's mercy is big enough, not only for individuals, but for institutions. You begin to realize that God's mercy and his story is great enough, not just to transform the local drug dealer, but actually to transform the local pharmacy. You begin to think, wow, what would it look like if the kingdom of God broke in at the local boots? chemist. You know, how, what does God's mercy look like for industries and companies? What does it look like for workplaces and universities? What, how big today is your view of his mercy? Is it big enough for an individual? Wonderful. Do you believe for a family? Stunning. But do you dare to dream of a view of his mercy in an outward focused lens that would say, I actually dare to dream that God's view of the world is much bigger than just simply someone coming to faith, that actually he wants to transform the very places, the very fabric of where we live our days, our workplaces, our companies, our economies, our industries, all of that good stuff. And so he says, I urge you in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. I love, I'm going to condense this. I love how Eugene Peterson phrases this in the message. He says, uh, here's what I want you to do in view of God's mercy. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your eating, sleeping, going to work life, and present it before God as an offering. He says, you know that thing that is part of your rhythm every day? Take that thing and see that as your offering to God. Recognize that somehow God is immersed in that, that somehow 
that worship to him. Now, most of us probably um, have difficulty connecting. We, we don't have any difficulty connecting God's glory with moments in church, right? We're like, yes, that's normal. We expect God's glory to be in the singing. Uh, won't it be amazing to sing like Handel's Messiah at Christmas? or the carols, we're like, that's kind of glorious. But our workplace, our everyday ordinary, you're, you're walking the dog life. Take that life and somehow realize God's in that, that's a whole other challenge. You're going to the hairdresser, obviously I don't, but some of you do, <laughs> that life. Take that, how do I present my going for a haircut to God as an offering? How do I take that everyday moment, everything I do and present it to him for an offering? And probably, and I know the guys are gonna touch on this and maybe even develop it further in the the seminar on kingdom at work, Um, but particularly when it comes to our workplaces, we don't always see them as filled with the mercy of God or the glory of God. And I believe that's a number one strategy of the enemy because if he can separate God's story from your workplace, he can arrest any outward focus in your life. As Mark Green wonderfully said at once, if God isn't relevant to us where we spend most of our time, how on earth would he be relevant to us the rest of the time? Right? If, if most of us spend, what, nine hours at work in a day? How many It's like eight or nine hours? How many of you are doing like four hours? I want that job. That, right. you know, that's what most of us. How many of you see your kids for nine hours a day like, and you're working? How many of you? Right. So most of us, that's where we spend most of our time. And he, he just says, hey, that's the place um, where God wants to show up. Would you fire that back in my thing? Thanks, buddy. That's the place where God wants to show up. So he says, take your everyday, ordinary life, your eating, sleeping, going to work life, and present it before God as an offering. And and, uh, very few of us actually realize God's glory is connected to the work that I do. Strangely, the people who do understand this somewhat, the kind of people who do get that God's glory is reflected in what they do every day, are the most overpaid, overrated people on the planet. They're called football players. (laughs) Right? And periodically, you'll see them, uh, let's just say they, they score a goal, they head the ball in the net, or they kick it in the net, and what they might do is they might run and strip off their top, revealing amazing abs, <laughs> and, or they'll have a t-shirt on that says, uh, Jesus, like, and then they might run over to a corner of the field, and they might do something like this. And what they're saying, as bizarre as it is, what they're saying is, God, somehow you gave me the ability to do this. And somehow your glory is reflected in this. And it's just strange that it's them. Try that if you're a dentist. (laughs) Imagine you're a dentist. And imagine you've just drilled the perfect hole in the right tooth. Now what I want you to do is to take that drill out and just run around the surgery, just like, and then stand and point it up. Because the truth is your dentistry is as much filled with the glory of God as a thousand hymns. That ordinary everyday activity is as beautiful to God as four messages in tongues today, three prophetic words, two healings, and a partridge in a pear tree. It has all the beauty and mystery of God revealed in that thing that he created you to do, which you do best every day of your life. If you're alive in your occupation, there's something glorious about that. And if we're going to have outward focused lives, we have to recognize that. Now, let's say you say, well, I'm not a dentist. Well, let's say you're an accountant. Let's say on Wednesday, you nail the spreadsheet. Like you just do it. It's done. And just take it, move slowly from your desk. As an accountant, you probably won't have apps, so let's just, uh, <laughs> and just go around the office. <laughs> and hold it up, because your accountancy is filled with the story, the beauty, the mercy, and the glory of God. That those things are crucially vital in the kingdom. And they're not vital because at work you can do something for God. You know, you can speak to a colleague. I hope you do that. I pray that you would do that. We wouldn't be 
hosting a conference and becoming outward focused if we didn't want you occasionally saying, hey, I'm a believer. But the point of your work isn't just so that you can tell people you're a Christian. It's so that God would be revealed through your work. In fact, did you know that the first reference to the Holy Spirit in the Bible beyond creation, where God actually comes upon a person, was in relation to their workplace. It was somebody going about the task of engraving and making jewelry. The Bible says that God had filled them with his spirits, the first reference to being filled with the spirit. And it wasn't for something amazingly spiritual or religious, it was just for creativity. And it's always a little surprising to me, and perhaps to you too, um, and we love all that stuff, we, uh, we, I love it. I love it when God comes in my life and I, I can barely speak. You're like, we wish he was doing that now. But I do love that, right? I love it when he comes and I'm shaking. I'm good with that. That's, that's a great thing. Um, but it's also a little surprising to me when, you know, when um, in gatherings like this, when the power of the Lord comes, people, whoa, whoa, right? But it never, ever happens at work. Right? Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, is, isn't it amazing that it never happens when we're given the PowerPoint presentation at the company board meeting? <laughs> is God just not interested enough in our PowerPoint presentation that transforms a company and releases hope into a sector of society? Is he, is he more interested that we just get that spiritual thing nailed? Is there a reason he doesn't show up in those moments? Or is it perhaps that we've kind of separated those things in our mind, right? That God, if, if God isn't coming upon us in those moments, then we have, we've got some questions to ask. This. So here's the deal. Uh, if there's a lady in my church, let's say, and she's a pilot, if we're praying for her a Sunday, I want her hands to shake gloriously. <laughs> if she is flying the plane that I'm on on the Monday... I do not want her hands to shake ever, <laughs> right? I don't, I don't want that to happen ever. But I recognize that what she does on the Monday is way more filled with the Spirit of God than what she did on the Sunday. Do you understand? It's ordinary. It's every day. And God says, here's what I want you to do. Present that as your act of worship. See that as something that I'm involved in. I know it's beyond the building, which is the whole focus again of this time together, beyond the building. But as we recognize that God is with us beyond the building, we can recognize that his glory and his story can be revealed in, this, in these moments of our lives where these things are beginning to break out. So he says, hey, this is your true and proper worship. This is the thing, what you do in your everyday ordinary, that's the thing that's most glorifying to God, which is most honoring to him, and yet it doesn't always feel that way. And he says, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I'm sure you grew up as I did in a church culture that would often uh, say that it this way, almost like... Um, don't cuss, don't chew, don't go with girls that do, right? It's that kind of idea. Stay, st stay out of culture, really, was the way to do this. Don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world. And that kind of meant, okay, stay, stay safe. Don't get contaminated by the world around you. Make sure you're, uh, so there's certain places you don't go, there's certain areas you don't go into. And we get a little afraid, don't we, that people would get contaminated by their environment. Consider, for example, the advice we give to the young person on their way to university. We just had fun yesterday with uh, one of our young girls who's currently at uni. Um, not our young, but a girl who's with us two years ago. Uh, but typically what we say to students going to university is we warn them, <laughs> if they're kids or they're in our churches, we typically warn them of the excesses. Right? We're like, make sure you don't do this, watch this, guard this. And then, and then we're like, and watch the philosophy professor. And pretty much we're trying to get them a faith that will survive university. Right? When actually God's intention was that their faith would transform the university. Right? God's goal isn't just that you make it through your uni, year, uni years and your faith is still intact after the assault of atheism and science. <laughs> God loves science. He made it up. He's a genius. He's the best scientist ever. He loves scientists. Right? He's right in the middle of all that stuff. So he's not just like, oh, you've done well. You got through uni. And what we say to our kids is this. You know, you've done such an amazing job at school. 
that you just got a promotion. Our kids are radical. They, they do things like um, one of our young lads, he, he had a, an assessment for English which was on friendship. <laughs> in his school, it's just a regular school, it's not a uh, church school. He's, he's doing an assessment in English, and it's on friendship, and so he's making this presentation, it's an uh, oral presentation, he's making the presentation on it, and as he's talking about friendship, he begins to realize, I should really tell them about my best friend. And so he begins to tell them about his best friend, Jesus, and what that relationship means to him. And he said, I didn't really know what to do next, I thought, what would they do in church? He said, if any of you wants to know my best friend, Jesus, <laughs> this is English presentation, right? So if any of you want to know my best friend, Jesus, just raise your hand. And uh, six people raised their hand. And he wasn't expecting that at all. So he thought, I better just make sure. He said, what I'm saying right now, if you would like my best friend, Jesus, to be your best friend, Raise your hand. I think it was either 11 or 12. I don't remember exactly. 11 or 12 people raised their hand, including the teacher. <laughs> right? Well, when you have kids like that, what we're saying to them is when you, when you go to university, you've been faithful in a little. Now God is entrusting much to you. The question isn't can your faith survive university. The question is can university survive your faith. That place is going to begin to be transformed. And so when he writes and he says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, uh, what we've done in church is we've discipled people to make them strong enough to survive culture rather than bold enough to transform culture. And what we've done is we've surrendered the industries and the companies of our cities in that regard because we've been afraid to engage. I once, I once, um, was speaking a couple of years ago in a church, very well-known church globally, is speaking in, in a church there, and I referenced G.K. Chesterton's quote that every man who knocks on the door of a prostitute is looking for God, and I was just saying how um, God shows up in unlikely places. Well, a couple of years later, I returned just in, in the summer. Um, I returned, and the, the guy comes to me, comes up to me and said, hey, when you were here last, it changed everything for me. And people sometimes say that to preachers, to be kind. They just, I, I cannot say, oh, thanks. I did my kind little doggy nod, thanks. <laughs> and uh, I didn't really think too much more of it. And he said, no, you don't get it. It changed everything. And he sort of had my attention at that point. He said, you see that girl over there? And there's a girl with a, like a cast on her leg. And I thought he was going to want me to go pray for her. I said, sure, I see her. And, and he said, come on over. And so I'm getting ready to pray for her. And he said, I don't want you to pray for her. He says, she's a, a girl who works in the strip bar that I'm the manager of. Now, now you've got my attention. <laughs> and he begins to tell me the story that when I mentioned that quote about G.K. Cheston, he had just come to faith a few months previously. And he was just wrestling with the what do I do with my job, because he, he's the manager of a strip bar. What do I do with that? He said, I want you to know in that moment when you said that every man who knocks on the door of a prostitute is looking for God, I realized every man who comes to a strip bar is looking for God. Now this may upset some of you, and I'm okay with that. Um, <laughs> but since that time, I think it was either 15 or 25 of the clients and family members have come to faith. They've been baptizing them, doing meals for them, and he suddenly realizes, gosh, we're the contaminators. There's not a place in culture that we need to be afraid of going into, right? You know, you'd be like, oh boy, am I strong enough for this? Christ is in you, the hope of glory, and you begin to recognize that. As so he says, don't conform to the power of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Just think differently about the environments that you're in because the truth is it all belongs to the Father, doesn't it? There is no sacred secular. God owns it all, doesn't he? Isn't it all his? Someone once said, there's not a square inch of creation over which God does not cry, ah, this is mine, this belongs to me. And so when we're thinking of becoming outwardly focused, what does that mean for us then in relation to the places where we spend most of our lives. I, th I think for too long the church has 
kind of been intimidated by culture. And then for a long time, what we tried to do was impress the culture. Tried to be culturally relevant. There was a huge move in churches to be culturally relevant, right? We tried to copy and imitate what was happening in culture around us. And I really don't mean to offend you in this, but, but we did strange things like, um, who would agree that God is the best artist ever? Like, if you've seen a sunset, you're like, that's pretty cool, right? If you live where I live, for sure, you're like, wow, that's radical. The, the Atlantic on a day when the wind is up is, you're like, wow, this is stunning, right? She's an amazing artist, but I, I don't know how we did this. And if you do this, please don't be offended. I just want to explain something. But I don't know how we did this, but what we did is we kind of looked at art around us, and then we thought what would be really cool is if we took art and we reduced the inner services to someone painting at the front. Right? And honestly, there's only so many doves I can see and be surprised. Oh, it's a dove. Who knew? It's a lion. Right? You've got, there's about six of them that kind of do the rounds, isn't there? It's a tsunami. Right? The, the, and you begin to realize, look, if God has wired you for art, for God's sake, do art. But do it in a way that evokes wonder, that inspires curiosity to people. And do not, for whatever else you do, do not hide it in a church building. Take it into the heart of the city. Put on an art exhibition and let people see the glorious nature, favor, and character of God displayed through your art. Because the greatest use of your art is not on a little space here, but is so that the world can see had a girl in our church, and she said, uh, um, she said, I'd like to dance in church. And I said, no, you can't. We don't do that here. And she was so sad. She had a little cross. Isn't it mean of me to do that for her? <laughs> yes, it was. It was, wasn't it? It was. She was cross with me. And uh, I said, we don't do that here. And she said, why don't you do that here? And I said, well, it provokes lust in young men. <laughs> it's teasing, a little glint in my eye. I said, are you really saying God has called you to dance? I said, yeah. I said, that's amazing. It's a wonderful thing. I said, here's the deal. I, I, I have great faith for you. And she's looking at me like, you clearly don't. You won't even let me dance in church. Huh? But I said, I believe that God could use your dance in a great way. And I said, but you need to know, I'm never going to let you dance in church. And so she went away greatly discouraged but a few months later, she opened a dance school in our city. And for the last few years, her dance school is oversubscribed and there's a huge waiting list. You know, she's never returned to thank me. <laughs> I'm feeding her family today through a business. She's never once come back to say, I am so glad for that moment because I would have settled for a pirouette on a Sunday when God has a business that would bless the city. It's just bigger, isn't it? The dance is so much bigger than those moments on a stage. Or what about this one? What about this one? Sometimes ladies will come to me and they say, do you believe in women in ministry? Might as well stand in every tone in the room while I can, right? Um, <laughs> do you believe in women in ministry? And I look at them like, I think so. I think Angela Merkel's running Germany. If you're asking me, do I believe that the best use of your life is standing on a 12-foot stage in front of 150 or 200 or however many people it is, then probably not. But I believe you have something in you that can transform nations. You, for sure, you can stand on their stage anytime you want and teach whatever the Lord gives you to teach, but you have more on you than that. You can transform worlds. You can run governments and parliaments and all that kind of stuff. And if you think that the pinnacle that God if we think that, that the God's goal for us was to make us a Christian so we could serve in church, then we're missing what God has for us, right? He wants to unleash us in the world. Now, I may get passionate in a moment. I realize I've been very gentle the whole time, apart from those two brief moments there where I may have offended some, but I may get passionate in a moment in this because um, we, have to, we have to break out of this sacred secular thing if we're gonna become an outward focused community. And we don't mean to do it, and I guess you guys wouldn't do it here, but um, sometimes we do it in the strangest ways. 
We do it in the strangest ways, by things we affirm in our community. So sometimes, um, within that, we, we would say, you know, our church has broken the sacred secular divide, but uh, But sometimes what we do, and you may do this and it's a great practice, is uh, maybe once a year you have the folks who are involved in children's ministry come to the front and you applaud them. How many of you think that's a brilliant idea? Right? Isn't that a brilliant idea? Because like, we all know none of the rest of us want to do it pretty much, right? So you're like, oh, thank you, dude. Well done. Whole year with my kids, dude. That's just like amazing, right? It's amazing. It is amazing. Except we very rarely ever do it for teachers. Right? And for every once you do that for your children, Sunday school workers, whatever call you call them, you have to at least do it at least five times for teachers, maybe even ten. Because the subtle message that you communicate if you don't do that is that what they do with kids for one hour a week is more important to God than what these people do with kids every day of the week, 40 hour weeks, that somehow that's holy and should be applauded in church while that one is completely ignored. And I want to tell you that God is in the comprehensive school way more than he's in the Sunday school. That, that God doesn't just want kids learning about Noah and Moses. He wants them. You'll know everything I'm saying to you is true if you hear music coming from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Filling the room. <laughs> that, that he's all over that. And we, we don't mean to do that. We do it with the young person, isn't it? And it's usually a young man. Uh, consider that, the young man, the young person who goes off to Bible college. And as he's going to Bible college before he goes, or uh, a couple of weeks before he goes, typically they'll bring him to the front of the church and they'll say, let's call him Tim. This is Tim. Tim is going to be going to wherever it is. He's going to be studying theology and Tim really needs our prayers. And would you pray for Tim? And as some of you might feel that you want to do more than pray. Some of you might want to provide. You might want to give a gift to Tim. Tim would like that, wouldn't you, Tim? Yes. <laughs> Tim is nodding. Tim gets back after the first term from Bible college. Hey, Tim, come and tell us what you're learning. And Tim's going to speak today and Tim's going to lead today. Meanwhile, the young lady who's studying journalism, nobody ever called her to the front of the church. Nobody ever asked her how her course is going. There are no intercessory groups praying for her. She who's going to write stories that are actually going to frame mindsets and change culture. Nobody's asking her what Jesus is doing there. And she gets back after the first term and she thinks these people don't care at all about what God has wired me to do. And then, nine months later, we wonder why Susie stopped coming to church. And we don't mean it, but we've created this divide. And it shows up in moments like that. Now we're saying we shouldn't pull Tim, Tim to the front. No, pull Tim to the front, but make sure Susie comes too, right? right? The days are coming, the days are coming that we long for where we're going to begin ordaining sculptors and poets and dancers and authors and architects and dentists and hairdressers. I love hairdressers. Hairdressers the only people unsurprised by Brexit. <laughs> right? I don't even know why we have these opinion polls. Do not do opinion polls. Just go chat to hairdressers. They'll tell you what everyone is thinking, right? The only demographic that you'll not find in there is probably bald people like me, right? But everyone else, you'll know what society is thinking if you just chat to hairdressers. You don't have to read The Guardian. Just chat to the hairdresser. You're going to know tons about where people are at in their thinking and that. And the hairdressers, and we're ordaining all of these people. Aren't you longing for the day when we recognize God is as much involved in those things as he is on people doing what I do for a living? I thought you'd be happy about that. But aren't you longing for those days? And aren't you longing for the days when we ordain musicians? Not just like church worship man, but musicians. And wouldn't it be great? When was the last time you heard somebody say, the Holy Spirit is here tonight to anoint boards of governors? <laughs> Wouldn't that be an amazing ministry time? I want to be in that ministry time one day. Like, the Holy Spirit is here tonight for dentists. <laughs> don't, do you, how come all the anointings that seem to be in gatherings that we hold like this, I need to be careful. Um, <laughs> 
come all the anointings that we hold in gatherings like this are usually some church connection? Like, yeah, the anointing's here for church planting. Why is the anointing never there for business planting? I'm just wondering. Shouldn't there be some gatherings where we're in his presence together? Where people are like, there's anointing now in the room for people to start their own business. If you're here and you've had a dream of starting your own business, entrepreneurial vision for the city, the Spirit of the Lord is here to empower that today. We want to pray for you because we believe there's acceleration. And then what we want to do, we want to raise up and bring an offering around that. We had, um, I'm going to lean into something I'm going to lean into tonight, but we had... um, 10, 10 business leaders in our city who each gave 10,000 pounds. We put a pot together of 100,000 pounds to this thing called Venture Causeway, where um, basically like Dragon's Den, any young entrepreneur could say, here's my idea, and we would take whatever one's worth. And they ended up 17 businesses that they were able to give some money to. And it's just wonderful when church begins to partner in that way with business. And so he says, hey, take your everyday, ordinary life, present it before God as an offering, recognizing that he's in all these areas of culture, that he wants to empower you there, and that whatever day it is, Monday, Tuesday, when you go back to work, the Holy Spirit is already there, and he wants to help you become his witness in that place. And that isn't always sharing your faith. It may well be that, but sometimes that's just having brilliant solutions for your company. Sometimes that's just being really kind to your coworkers. It's doing the everyday, ordinary thing. And so in a moment, uh, we're gonna do an ordinary thing. We're gonna go for lunch. All of this feels really spiritual, but eating a chicken, and that actually does sound really good at the minute. (laughs) But isn't he, as much in our chicken bites, I'm not speaking pantheism here, but isn't our eating and drinking filled with the glory of God? Isn't it? I have to say though, it will be a little weird if any of you go to McDonald's and start going, oh, oh, that, that'll be weird. But, but didn't Paul say whatever you do, whether eating or drinking, God's glory is in it. Do it to his glory. His glory is in it. So there was one guy. There was one guy. And what he knew how to do was make chocolate. And I realize I've lost all the ladies in that moment. So just come back for a minute. We're going to leave in 10 minutes. Is he knew how to make chocolate. And so he started a chocolate factory. Yeah. When he, when he built his factory, he looked at the workers who were coming there and he realized he wanted to help them. And he wanted to give them not only employment, but he wanted to give them homes. And so he decided to build homes for them. But he didn't build homes at the cheapest rate for them, which would have been 700 pounds, I believe, those days. He actually went just above that. He built at the higher scale. He got them homes with gardens. He did that. And then he continued just to develop the whole community. It's still there today. You can see it in Bourneville, in Birmingham. And one guy, all he knew, it's not an amazing skill, is it? Chocolate. Like, no, it is amazing. But you know what I mean, right? Right? It's not an amazing thing. But God used it to bring jobs to the community, to create homes in the community, to do the ordinary thing. And I want to suggest to you today, that the moments when you're most effective as a witness for Jesus, that's all this has been driving it, is when you're doing something that feels like you're not even witnessing for Jesus at all. You're just dating your wife, you're walking your dog, you're eating a bar of chocolate, you're with your friends. Those moments there, God's power is all over. So shall we stand together?